Hello, everyone. Let's quickly recap the contents of the next week, which is week number seven, I believe. Unbelievable. Semester is soon half over. What we did talk about was how rigid bodies move through space. And we had discussed the key kinetic principles of rigid bodies. The first one was LMB, which, of course, we remember as the sum of all forces acting on our rigid body equaling the total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. The next thing we introduced was AMB. And here we showed that the net torque with respect to a point B was given by, and now there came this whole thing, velocity of point B across the linear momentum of the rigid body plus now the time derivative of HB plus M times RCM minus RB cross VB, right? This was the most general form. And then, of course, what we discussed is we should always choose point B in a wise fashion. For example, B could be the center of mass or a point which is fixed, which has a zero velocity. And in this case, what happens is this term cancels and this term cancels, and we're only left with this over here. And then, of course, we have to find out what this I, uh, this, this HB, this angular momentum is. And we showed that if point B, you know, is uh, one of these points that we fixed here, we can always write this for a point on the body as moment of inertia tensor IB times omega. Right? And that simplifies a lot. And then the last thing we discussed was the work energy balance. And work energy balance for a rigid body is almost the same as for a particle. What we have to consider here is that the rigid body in general has translational and rotational motion, and hence it also has these two contributions to its energy. And this means we have that the kinetic energy at state 2 minus the kinetic energy at state 1 is still given by the work done by all forces acting onto the rigid body which of course we can simplify if there's uh, potential forces by introducing a potential but the most important thing here is that the kinetic energy at any given time is two contributions namely first translational energy which we write like this the velocity of point c squared i'll get to a second what c is plus and then there's rotational kinetic energy which is one half omega times I C times omega. And most importantly, what we showed in class is that this holds only for certain points C, namely if C is either the center of mass or it's a fixed point again whose velocity is zero, in which case, of course, the first term disappears and it's a pure rotation. So what we see here is that um, sorry, the kinetic energy now consists of two parts, translational and rotational kinetic energy, and we need to consider both. Then we need to fix this point C wisely. And then one thing we discussed quite at length was this moment of inertia tensor IB, this thing up here. What exactly is that? How can we deal with this? Um, and so forth. And we discussed a number of things here. So if we look at this IB tensor, the first thing we realized was that it's symmetric. And it's symmetric by definition, that one we know. Also, it's additive. So, if, for example, you have a compound body, which looks something like this, right? It's hard to draw on this thing here. Let's see if this pen is working. Yeah. Let's say if this is body one, and this is body two, and you want the moment of inertia with respect to a certain point B, then the total IB is nothing else but the sum of the two, right? It's IB one, in this case, plus IB2. And you can evaluate them one at a time and simply add them up. This also works in the subtractive fashion. So, for example, if you have a cylinder which has a certain moment of inertia, and now you cut a hole into there. What you would do in this case is take the whole moment of inertia of the full cylinder and subtract the one of the hole. Right? That's one point we discussed. The other thing is we talked about symmetry axis. And remember how, you know, if you have some coordinate system. And now the one example we did talk about in class was a cone that looked something like this. Right? And in this particular case, what we saw was that there are two reasons why um, 
we should choose our axis like this because whenever an axis like these two over here these two axes are perpendicular standing on a symmetry plane of the cone and they're standing on those planes meaning the origin is in the symmetry planes and they're perpendicular to these planes then what happens is if this is let's call this x1 x2 x3 in this case we know that all off diagonal components which have either an i or a 2 in them vanish and they're essentially zero and this is what we see over here all right next what we also saw is if an axis is an axis of rotational symmetry in this case it's x1 right this is an axis of rotational symmetry in this case we also know that all the components which have index one in them and our off diagonal are zero and this allows us to choose our axes wisely we should always try to make sure that the uh, tensor is diagonal if at all possible we don't have any off axis components because this allows us to decouple the equations if we have a diagonal moment of inertia tensor that means we're in the principal frame in this case the three values are the eigenvalues if we're in 2d that's the further thing we looked at then of course simplify a lot and angular momentum balance simply reduces to the net torque b i b times omega dot where this i b is what we call the centroidal moment of inertia and we have seen how exactly this works for example for a bar or a cylinder that's rotating and so forth um, and then one more thing we discussed was the theorem that's named after among others steiner and this is something we know from mechanics too. What this basically means is if you know the moment of inertia tensor with respect to some point, and in 2D that's relatively simple, let's consider, for example, that we have a long and slender bar. Right? And for a long and slender bar, for rotating about the center, let's call this the center of mass here. In this particular case, we know that the moment of inertia tensor ICM is m times the length squared over 12. If you're now rotating about another point, let's say that we're, for example, rotating about one of the endpoints. This is point. In this case, we can evaluate the moment of inertia tensor by using Steiner's theorem. And in this case, that tells us that, sorry, I'm running out of pens that are writing here. IB is nothing else but the original one, ML squared over 12, plus the mass times how much we're moving, and this is L over 2. And in this fashion, we can find the moment of inertia, the centroidal one or others, for but any point you want, if you know it with respect to one point at least. Then the very last thing we discussed, which I'm going to do up here, is the so-called angular momentum transfer formula. I hope, no, you cannot read this at all. Let me try this one. The AM transfer formula. And what this tells us is that the relation of the angular momentum between any two points, B and A, is like this. HB equals HA plus, and what we need here now, and I'm looking at the cheat sheet, is the linear momentum across the vector from A to B. And this is very nice because it applies to all points, not just the one which are on the rigid body, but also to other points. And so if you know, for example, the angular momentum HA of some point which is on a rigid body, you want to hop to a point B which is off the rigid body, you can use that. All right. And so that's everything we discussed when it comes to the kinetics of rigid bodies LMB, AMB, and the work energy balance.